Right? Are we good? Yep. Okay. Ta da! I'll start yeah, all over. Yeah, all right. Here for Gary. So you probably saw those big red and white signs that said, do not enter as you came to the fork in the road. Sorry that that's so blaring, but we've recently had some trouble with people not realizing that unauthorized vehicles means no unauthorized vehicles can go past that spot. Welcome, mainly because that's a construction site over there. Now we have really big construction equipment there and it's a dangerous spot to be if you're not authorized and nobody knows that you're there. So what we're doing on that part of the property is building a program facility that will have an observatory, indoor program space that can accommodate everybody, um, a presentation area, and then some outdoor seating with also a stage that's not a real big stage, but a presenting space that is kind of down the slope right on the waterfront. Um, the, the sidewalks are already there. There's a big wide open space, and we haven't taken down much of the forest. We didn't want to. There's conservation easement on the property to not develop it that way. Um, we actually are only taking up the same footprint of the building that was formerly there. But this project is gonna take at least 12 months. So until that time, this is what we have to deal with. So thank you all for coming and dealing with it. I'm gonna give you a map since you've just come in. This is from Michigan State University Abrams Planetarium. Did you folks, you got one over there. Okay, all right, so. Also, um, we do programs year-round. Our programs happen rain or shine. No matter what the weather is doing, you can always learn something about the night sky. And I'm very fond of saying that if you go out of your way to try to have an experience with the night sky, you will be rewarded. It might not happen at the moment that you think, but something good will come toward you. Particularly when you have a program like the arts inspired by the cosmos, then I would just like to say that in addition to us seeking the phenomena in the night sky, that phenomena is seeking us. And this is something that comes out of an ancient understanding that human beings come from the starry worlds to the earth. So it's not that we're on the earth just looking up at that and trying to figure it out, but the ancients believed that each one of us comes from a star. And on our way from that star toward the earth, we pick up the forces of the fixed stars and the rhythm of the planets and build that right into this physical body and then unfold a biography which tells the starry world what it is to be a human being on the earth. So we see this reflected in a lot of the art, the architecture, agricultural practice, civic organization throughout the ages. A lot of it inspired by humanity's understanding what is my relationship to the stars. So the ancients built pyramids. Uh, in the Middle Ages, they started building cathedrals. We now build telescopes, everything reaching up to try to say something about that up there can tell me about who I am here. So right now, well, I should explain to you a little bit about myself. I got my degree in English literature, so I come toward the night sky out of the humanities. I'm not an astronomer, although I know a lot about astronomy, and it's not that astronomy isn't valid and appropriate and serviceable, but also there's a lot of other ways to get into the night sky, through story, through poetry, and through art. And so my mission really is to not just protect the night sky, but to safeguard the human imagination so that we can continue to create out of the inspiration of the night sky that inspired some of the great art that we know as a humanity. Now, almost two thirds of the residents of the US live where they can't see the stars of the Milky Way at night. A lot of folks don't know the names of the stars. They don't know the names of the constellations. If they do know them, they don't know where they came from. So if we can't see it, we can't name it, we're being cut off from something that belongs to us as a people that is always expressing that understanding. So we're going to take a little journey, and I did share with you my bias right now is the muses, so we're going to see a pretty hefty uh, presence of the muses in what I'm about to do. I wonder if we want to turn these lights off, do you think? Or do you want them on for that? Because really it's not, I mean, we can, good? You want the lights up or down? Down. Down, okay. Now, uh, <laughs> I don't know where the light switch is. You'd think I would, but I'm not here to play with that often enough. Uh, Rod, do you want a, a map? Okay, I don't know if he wants a map over there. All right. Okay, Gary, who just flipped the lights, also has to tap the button so we can advance to the next slide. <laughs> But before you go, I do like to start with this poem by William Butler Yeats, which oftentimes I use as a disclaimer when speaking about the night sky from the realm of the story. Because 
it really isn't going to be about how far things are away from us or what the surface temperature is or what the life cycle of a star is. This is going to come at you with totally different information. And William Butler Yeats wrote this lovely, lovely poem that I think really kind of captures the mood and how vulnerable you are to stand in the world of astronomy and speak about this from the realm of the stars. So it's like this. Had I the heavens embroidered clothes, inwrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark clothes of night and light and the half light, I would spread these clothes beneath your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams beneath your feet. Tread softly, for you tread on my dreams. Okay, let's go. So, how many of you have been watching the morning sky in the east, watching Jupiter and Venus and Mars? If you're far enough south, you've maybe been seeing Mercury on the horizon, and then just this last week, the crescent moon swept boot through. This is an actual picture that was taken last week of the crescent moon with the planet Venus. So, this is a remarkably beautiful apparition that we've been seeing for weeks now, and it's going to continue well to the end of the year. And then Saturn is going to begin to emerge as one of our morning planets. And then in January, we will be able to see all five objects that are visible to the naked eye in our planetary system in the morning sky at one time. So this is not really an alignment because they're not all lined up at the same degree of the zodiac, but it is a remarkable presence. Jupiter, which is also in this scene right now, takes 12 years to go around the sun. So it's only in the place where it is right now once every 12 years. Venus is moving at a cycle that's less than one Earth year. Mars is moving every two years. Saturn is moving every 28 years. For, so for them to all pile up in one spot is kind of remarkable. If nothing else, it, it just takes your breath away when you see it in a beautiful morning sky. But for the ancients, this would have been a speaking of the divine world. Now they saw the fixed stars as, well, the stars and the planets as letters. And the muses were the ones that discovered the letters and combined them and gave poetry to humanity. Now, the fixed stars were the consonants, the T, the M, the B. The moving stars, the planets, are the vowels, O, A, A, these things that, that move. And we see the planets move. So they believed that there was this combining of star and planetary energies that would give language to humanity. First, poetry. And the poets and the storytellers were regarded as the highest because they had access to the muses who brought this inspiration from the starry world. Let's go to the next slide. So this, you tap it again. So this is a pretty well-known image of, from the Renaissance. This is Sandro Botticelli's painting of the birth of Venus. So Venus is as morning star for the Greeks, Venus was related not only to this image that we see here by Botticelli, but related to Prometheus, which reminds me, I wanted to light a candle, if you don't mind. I'm going to stop right now and light a candle because, um, because we need more beauty in the world. And I would just, whatever you would like to dedicate this candlelight to, I invite you to, to do that. Um, it's a beeswax candle. Beeswax is a lovely, lovely wax for... Um, for candles, and it was once believed that a beeswax candle allows you to see across the threshold, and for that which is across the threshold to see us. So I'm going to take a moment, and it, and it smells really lovely. <laughs> so I'm going to take a moment and light this, and hello everybody over there. I hope that you can see what's happening here. Okay. <laughs> and I have maps of the night sky. Did you get one? Okay. All right. So as I strike the match, then you can quietly to your, in your own heart state your intention. And if it's French, it's okay. Okay. All right. So, Venus as morning star was oftentimes regarded as Prometheus, who brought fire to mankind. It was a civilizing force. Prometheus also, like the Muses, is credited with bringing the combination of letters to humanity for language, for poetry, for speaking. So let's advance to the next slide. Um, this is a poem by George William, also known as A.E., about the morning star. So actually it's the morning star and the evening star. Venus is the brightest object in our sky after sun and after moon. So if it's in the morning sky, it's the morning star. If it's in the evening sky, it's the evening star. 
Now, typically, the brightest thing in the morning or the evening will be the evening star, but it's usually Venus. When we're talking about the morning star, we're usually talking about Venus. This is a lovely, lovely poem. I'm not going to stand here and read the whole thing to you, but I can just recite the first couple of lines. In the black pool of midnight, Lou has slung the morning star, and its foam in rippling silver whitens into day afar, falling on the mountain rampart piled with pearl above our glen, only you and I, beloved, moving in the fields of men. Venus is also related to Aphrodite, both of them regard as, regarded as goddesses of love and beauty. So in speaking about the arts inspired by the cosmos, here's a rendering from the early 1900s of the inspiration that comes from witnessing the morning star. Do you want the whole thing? Are you good with it? Okay, well, let's go to the next slide. So when we talk about the constellations around the Earth, oftentimes we, imagine, we have to imagine that the Earth is at the center. In this image, you see the sun at the center with the Earth going around it, and then around that, this embrace of the constellations of the zodiac. Now, the constellations of the zodiac stand out among all the constellations that there are because when we look into the night sky, if we follow the path of the moon, if we follow the path of the planets, we see that they're only ever moving in front of these groups of stars. We're never going to see the moon hanging out in the region of the Big Dipper. We're never going to see Saturn in the region of Draco. They're only going to move in front of these 12 constellations. So these ones stood out. And it wasn't just that the ancients were laying on the earth and looking up and saying, oh, that looks like a, a lion, or that looks like a guy pouring water. It was this idea that we come from a star, and as we come from our star, moving through these starry regions of the zodiac, we pick up forces that form the human body. And then moving through the, the spheres of the planets, we pick up the rhythm of the inner organism. So in speaking about the constellation Aries, you can see it doesn't look very much like a ram. But a ram is a creature on the earth that uses its head. And the ancients understood that the forces for the human head come from that region of the sky. So they said, we will call this ram, because the ram uses its head. That's the region where we get the forces for the human head. The rib cage, cancer. Cancer is a crab. It's got a hard outer shell protecting a soft inner organism, just like the rib of the human being, protecting heart and lung. OK, you can go to the next slide. So all of those 12 constellations that we saw going around the Earth and around the sun were taught about in the ancient mystery schools. Now these are called the glyphs, the zodiacal glyphs. These are symbols that are pretty well known by everybody. If you've ever read your newspaper horoscope or if you've ever had your chart done, or, I mean, these are well, well used. But there was a time when you were forbidden to create this image and let somebody see it who had not been initiated into the mystery school. Because the image itself, that symbol, imparted a certain kind of power. So when you were initiated into the mystery school and this cosmic wisdom was being given to you, it would be given according to symbol. So Aries, this, this image that's drawn that shows something rising up. It's, you could say, the forces of the human head open to the cosmic thought. Taurus is related to our speaking and to this region. I, I never can say this word right. Is it larynx? Larynx? I get it mixed up every time. So. This is Taurus. Gemini, which is regarded as the twins, and it does look like twins, the constellation. It is wherever we have symmetry in our body, usually the limbs, the arms, but we have two legs, we have two arms, we have two ears, two eyes. Those, that twin system, that symmetry, is coming from Gemini. Then, as I said, when we get to cancer, this is the rib cage that protects the soft inner organism of heart and lung. Leo symbolized for the ancients the heart. The forces for the human heart stream toward humanity on the earth from the region of Leo. You can imagine that little, it looks like a little ball on the left hand side of that symbol, it was like a seed that had been fructified by the spiritual world in the celestial environment and now was reaching down toward the human being on the earth. So that tail coming down. Then when we get to Virgo, now you see that it's more being embodied in the human being and Virgo, if you tip that symbol over, see how it looks like an M with that tail coming in? If you tip it over, it's the intestines. So it's this inner region of the human being where we have not only the, 
large and small intestines, but we have the kidney, we have the liver, the spleen, these things all protected by Virgo, also regarded as the pregnant virgin or the maiden, and that's where the, the planets then would move around protected in that area. Libra represented the hip. Libra is the point of balance. Um, not now, but used to be several uh, hundred years ago that the point of equinox came, happened when the sun was moving into the region of Libra. Now it's still in front of the stars of Virgo. But you could see that the symbol for Libra looks like an equal sign, so day and night are of equal length, and the sun is setting. But this is the point of balance, which is the hip region of the human being. Now, for thousands of years, it was understood that these six, these, uh, how many did I say? Seven. Seven constellations are ascending constellations. And when you look at the human form, we can see from the hip up, we are freed upward. Our feet, everything else still going down throughout the earth, but the human being is trying to ascend these forces that descend from the star toward the earth and then lift them back up to the stars. The scorpion represents the reproductive organs. So now it's trying to penetrate earth forces and reproduce. When we get to Sagittarius, this has to do with the thigh. And you can imagine that this line coming across that arrow, now it's penetrated earth forces and that line means that it's gone across that threshold of the earth. Now in ancient times also, Sagittarius, welcome, come on in and just cozy in where you can see. Sagittarius also is represented by the centaur. So half of the body is a horse and the top half is a human being. And with that arrow is aiming toward the higher human nature to overcome the animal nature. Then when we get to Capricorn, Capricorn is a sea goat. So the top half of the body is a goat and the bottom half has, it's like a tail, like a, a creature that's coming up out of the water. Capricorn is related to the knee joint or actually any of the joints, which was regarded by the ancients as a sacrifice that the gods made to give human beings mobility in the physical material world. The fact that we can bend our arms and our knees and walk about, this was a gift from the gods. Then when we get to Aquarius, it's really funny because Aquarius in ancient astrology is regarded elementally as an air sign. Even though it's the water man, it's not a water sign, it's an air sign. And you could imagine it that these seeming waves are actually like, so if you look at Cancer, and Cancer was the time when we would come to the summer solstice, and it's as though you're carrying a seed up to the spiritual world for fructification, and now carrying it back down toward the earth, it starts to come in at Leo, we start to embody it at Virgo, we land with it on the earth at Libra, then with Scorpio we're trying to reproduce it in the earthly plane, penetrate that, that plane through Sagittarius, give mobility to it through Capricorn, and then at Aquarius the earth begins to respond back to what we have brought from the spiritual cosmos. So what the ancients thought was human beings, we mediate between the celestial world and the earthly world. Our task is to recognize what and when do we bring something to the earth, what and when do we take back from the earth and give back to the spiritual world. So we see in Aquarius this kind of, if I'm bringing something to the earth, it kind of reverberates and resounds back. Aquarius represents the shin, part of the human being, and then Pisces is the feet. And when you look at the constellation Pisces, you'll see what looks like two fish bound together by a rope that has a knot with the star Risha that binds that knot. But when you look at this symbol of Pisces, you can imagine this as two faces looking at one another across a threshold. So this is, you could say, related to what St. Paul writes in the letter to the Corinthians where he says, now I see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know, even as also I myself am known. So you could say that when we arrive at Pisces, which is always regarded as the most spiritually developed of the signs, that we have the capacity to know ourselves in the physical world and in the spiritual world. So this line marks a threshold, physical world, spiritual world, and this is the human being seeing itself face to face in both of those worlds. Another way that the constellation Pisces was described was that they were like footprints, one in the physical and one in the celestial world. So that's just a, a quick rendering of what at least sustains through the ages that comes down to us from the time when these were regarded as sacred symbols and they couldn't just be sketched out and slapped in a newspaper and talked about, you know, put on t-shirts and stuff. I mean, these were sacred symbols that really imparted energy and life force to human beings. So I think the next slide now, I'm going to show you, oh, okay, well, we talked about the medical, 
you can go ahead and hit the next one. So I just went through all of this with you, but this is an image that comes from a book out of the Middle Ages, and it shows how the doctors of that time, they would actually look at what was happening in the body according to the constellations of the zodiac and where the planets were. So you can imagine a diagnosis might be that if you were having a certain type of ailment that the doctor would say, you need to go outside at night and take a walk under the light of the full moon when Saturn is above the horizon. Um, this would help with spleen. Mars has to do with gall and the gall bladder. So all of the planets connected to the inner organism of the human being and then the structure of the body itself, like is shown here in this. Has anybody ever seen this image before? It's pretty popular. So if you Google it, you'll find this will be one of the first ones that will pop up. But so what it is meant to, to depict is this understanding that the human form is held in place by the presence of the stars that surround the earth and as though divine beings were looking down at the human being. It wasn't really a question of what's physically at the center so much as it was that this is a living environment and the living attention is, on, is central, centered on what's happening with the human being on the earth. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So I think now what I wanted to do is show you, this is a contemporary artist who is living and working in England now. Her name is Gartra Goodwin, and she has spent several decades working with this idea of living forces streaming toward the human, human being through the zodiac, and she has sculpted these forms. I have the cards here, so you can look at them if you'd like. Each one of them has the metal that's aligned to the particular sign, or to, yeah, to the particular region. But this is her image for Aries. So Aries, which has this force of like the head and being really forthright and direct. Next. This is Taurus. So remember Taurus is a larynx, larynx, okay, this voice box. <laughs> so Taurus, and it has this really lovely quality of having the capacity to speak through. Next is Gemini. Again, remember Gemini is the twins. Then we get to Cancer, the crab which has this, this shell that protects this inner organism. So it has kind of a quality that's a little bit like Gemini, but it's much more dynamic. Now the reason I started to do it like this is because the astrology, typically the way we think about it now, is that on the first day of spring, the sun enters the region of Aries and then it starts to go up above the horizon until we get to summer solstice when it's entering the region of Cancer. And then it starts to come back down toward the horizon with the next sign, which is Leo. Leo is the heart forces. Um, and there is gold that she used in this particular sculpture. So are, are you seeing it? So really, this is art inspired by the cosmos. This is somebody that's working contemporaneous to us who's trying to understand how can I create these forms now out of contemporary understanding. Next, we have Virgo. So Virgo, remember, is this pregnant virgin holding this, this seed that would be fructified by the celestial world and bringing it back toward the earth. And then the next is Libra, this point of balance. But it's really very, uh, doesn't have any, it's not like static. It has this lovely kind of motion. Okay, the next slide shows the remix. So these are the sculptural forms of Gertrude Goodwin. And now starting with that point of, you could say point of equinox going into the earth, this is her rendering of the scorpion. It's so a scorpion with the reproductive region, and there's this really lovely quality of meeting, forces meeting to create there. Next, we have Sagittarius. Again, this really pointed kind of arrow, like really intentionally penetrating that threshold and um, bringing life into physical material form. Next, we have Capricorn. It does have this quality kind of of the goat. Uh, remember that Capricorn had to do with the capacity for bending at the joints, the knee joint, and this is the moment of winter solstice. Then next we have Aquarius. Aquarius, of all of the signs of the zodiac, is really the only one that has a certain kind of motion in it. So she's done this kind of waving, but has it more vertically rather than horizontally. And then finally, we have Pisces. So this quality of, and it, it looks very much like water to me, but what was standing behind that is this idea that we can get across this threshold from the physical into the celestial or the spiritual. Okay, again, the, go ahead. A yes, I am. I'm wondering about the size of these pieces. I'm not sure if she put it on here. 
<laughs> it doesn't say on here. I mean, I have them on little cards like these. I imagine that they're, they're bigger. And I just have to share with you that this is very, she would probably die if she knew that I, I just took a picture of it with my phone, cropped it and slapped it up there. But I really wanted to just demonstrate that, that this is ongoing. You know, there, there are people who are trying to work out of these impulses now and striving to understand what is our relationship with the stars in a way that really isn't dependent on a telescope or astronomical units, but really trying to live into form on the Earth. I mean, the ancients saw not only these stars that make up a constellation, they saw color, and they saw this related to certain trees and to certain animals and to certain... <coughs> certain things that, that populate our world and all of them aligned to what they saw as this majestic harmony in the celestial world surrounding the earth. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Then we get to Nicholas Copernicus. And I don't want to give him a bad rap, but things really change when Copernicus comes along. For centuries, human beings have been operating out of this idea and an understanding, not just a belief, but a knowing that we each of us come from a star. And there's a certain harmony and order related to that process. And the human being on the earth is central to the living attention of this celestial world that was the divine. Then we get to Nicholas Copernicus in the 1500s. And Nicholas Copernicus, I think if you tap the next one. So he lived from 1473 to 1543. He published a book, which I think if you tap the next one, it will show up. It's called um, On the Revolution of the Planets. Now... He wasn't using a telescope, but he was looking at what had come down to him as the science of astronomy from his forebears, particularly Claudius Ptolemy, who had published the Almagest, or Almagest, which was for centuries regarded as the Bible of understanding the motion of things around the earth in our sky. Copernicus came along and said, you know, He's got all these really elaborate epicycles and things moving around on their paths as they go around the Earth. It just might be that the Earth is actually the thing that's moving along with all of the other planets, and they're moving around the sun. Now, the legend about Copernicus is that he was a little frightened about putting this information out there into the public for public consumption. He wasn't trying to hurry and get the information out there because he thought he would get in trouble. And the story is that the book that was eventually published was published and put in his hands on the day that he died. So he wasn't really there to defend this idea, but he spent years sorting it out. He never, never saw the planet Mercury in the sky. He also imagined that the motion of the Earth with the planets around the sun was circular. So he thought that things were just moving in a circle around the sun. At the same time that Copernicus is on the Earth, we have the Renaissance artist, go ahead, is it coming? Michelangelo. Go ahead and tap the next two. So you can see that they're almost completely coincident in the time that they're on the Earth. While Copernicus is sorting out his theories of heliocentrism, sun at the center, Michelangelo is painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And I'm not going to say that one causes or refutes the other, but just suggest that this was happening simultaneously. And the question I have is, would Michelangelo have been able to paint this, which has also been an inspiration for centuries, this image of the creation of the human being on the earth, would he have been able to create this the same way if he had already known about the Copernican thought? Maybe he could have. But it's an interesting thing to consider when we look at what's happening simultaneously. New impulses arise on the earth. And not just in one particular discipline, not just in the world of art, not just in the world of science, not just in the world of dance or agriculture, but they kind of rise up simultaneously and we find masters expressing it throughout history. This is the thing that's the most consistent. And when we try to find what's happening coincident with new ideas in the world of astronomy, it's really fascinating to see that the astronomers really didn't quite have a monopoly on the new impulse, but there were tremendous things also being created simultaneously. So Michelangelo is painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with this magnificent artwork at the same time that Copernicus is totally changing the view of the world. Okay, next slide. Ah, 
sorry. I get all these like fades in. <laughs> I, it's easier if I'm holding the, the clicker myself. Okay, don't t touch it again. So, almost 100 years later, we get to Galileo, Italian astronomer who, unlike Copernicus, was not shy about this brand new information. He was the first human being to use a telescope to look into the night sky. So in 1609, he looks out into the sky. He sees craters and valleys and mountains on the moon. He sees moons orbiting Jupiter. He sees phases in the planet Venus. He sees spots on the surface of the sun. And as far as he's concerned, that proves that Copernicus was correct. Everything is not going around the Earth. There are things orbiting other objects have nothing to do with us. And everything is orbiting the sun. He announced this far and wide, got himself in big, big trouble. The church fathers called him in, made him kneel down and say, it's not moving, and promised he would stop teaching about that. And he did it. He obliged. He bent down. And the, and the legend about him is that he stood up and said, it's still moving. Whether you force me to say it's not or not, it's still moving. And he said, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. He was really saying, you know, if we just use our own reason and apply it to this apparent motion that we're finding around us, we can see that it is so. But imagine, for centuries of time, it was believed that the Earth was fixed at the center. We can still see it. The sun comes up in the east. It goes up overhead. It sets in the west. We give the verb of motion to the sun. We say, let's watch the sun set. We don't say, let's watch the Earth turn east, which is actually what's happening. So when Copernicus comes along and introduces this idea, things are no longer what they seem. And this is a scary place to be. Now, remember, when Galileo and Copernicus before him, when they come along with this idea, Isaac Newton isn't even born yet. There's no idea of gravitational force. So if we're moving, if we're hurtling around the sun and spinning, What's keeping us on the Earth? How does that work? Now, it used to be there was Atlas. He was holding the pillars of the heavens up so the stars didn't come crashing down on us. Not atmosphere. I mean, these were divine beings. And all of this was expressed through art and architecture. But then we come along with the technology that we as human beings create, and we start looking at it differently, and all of these divine worlds come crashing down. And it gets really, really scary. You can tap the next one. Nature is relentless and unchangeable, and it is indifferent as to whether its hidden reasons and actions are understandable to man or not. This is still an argument that you will hear a lot of scientists say today. It's true whether you believe it or not. So let's go to the next slide. A contemporary of Galileo was the poet John Donne. You can tap it again. And one more time. Now, John Donne was not really happy about this idea that was coming from Galileo and Copernicus. He saw it as a poet, as something that would wipe out humanity's understanding of its place in the world in a harmonious way. And he saw that this was going to result in every man for himself. And this is one excerpt of a poem that he wrote. Of course, he was upset that he had lost a very dear friend. But um, he chose this first anniversary of Galileo using his telescope to look into the night sky and spoke about this in part of the poem. He calls it this new philosophy. He says a new philosophy calls in doubt. So what he saw with this idea that the earth is not fixed at the center, but the sun is and everything's moving, that's going to create doubt. Because now things are not what they seem. And we don't know what to trust. So he said, a new philosophy calls in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost and the earth, and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. For freely men confess that this world's spent, when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new. So he's talking about, you know, we're, they, they consider that the earth is already done. Now we have to go beyond the earth to find new things. Um, I usually don't cut myself off right in the middle. This is a hard poem to memorize, but I do have it. <laughs> when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new, they see that this is crumbled out to his atomies. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, all just supply and all relation. Prince, subject, father, son, are things forgot. For every man alone thinks he hath got to be a phoenix, and none can be of that kind of which he is but he. The last part of that poem is really tough, but what he's talking about is once we're cast out of the center, then it's uh, me and only worried about me and mine. 
and it's every man for himself, and I've got to be at the top. I'm the phoenix, nobody can be what I am, and I'm taking care of it. That's what he saw was going to be a consequence of this new idea. So we can look through history and see whether or not that was true. And now we, we do have some of our leading thinkers in the world of astronomy. I'm thinking of like someone like Stephen Hawking, who say, they say things like, you know, humanity's not going to survive unless we populate another celestial body. It's, it's, it's a wild thought from the world of the poet who says, we still have a great deal on the earth that we haven't exhausted creatively. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, go ahead and, and tap one more time. This is Shakespeare's sonnet number 116. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. Now, he's somewhat contemporary to John Donne and Galileo. And the big thing that was going on at that time was particularly in Britain, they were trying to figure out how to navigate on the water according to the sky. Now they could figure out latitude, but not longitude. And so there was this great race. David Sobel has written a wonderful book about it called Longitude. But this was an instrument that was developed called a sextant that you could use. You'd take a fixed object in the sky and you're, so if you're on the, the, a boat, you would find this fist, fixed object and then you would turn that knob and bring it so that it looked like the object was right at the horizon. And then by reading the degrees that you had turned it, you could do a very sophisticated mathematical equation and figure out your location. Now, Galileo said by watching the moons orbiting Jupiter, you could navigate on the Earth. So it got really, really intense how human beings were trying to use the stars to figure out where they were. But what Shakespeare brings up in this sonnet, hello, come on in. What he brings up in this sonnet is, uh, let's see, I had to stand back a little bit because this one I do not have by heart. But he makes his direct reference to a sextant and how we can use it to measure the star. But that really doesn't tell us anything. Um, he says, let's see, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no, it is an ever fixed mark. So that's like talking about a star, a fixed star that doesn't move, that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. So what he's saying is, yeah, we can measure the position of a star with this sextant and figure out where we are on the earth, but that has told us nothing about that star. And that star is enduring just like love would be enduring. So you can see that what he's trying to do is use the technology that's contemporary to his time, related to the understanding of the celestial environment that was held at that time, and as a poet, explain that this technology is not telling us anything about the stars. It helps us use the stars, but it's not revealing them to us. So the poets are still kind of standing on the side of saying, you know, the technology's great, but there's another way to understand what this is. Okay, let's move on. Ah, the muses, I promised, right? <laughs> so there are a couple different ideas about how many muses there are. The most popular being from Hesiod, that there are nine muses. You can go ahead and tap the next one, Gary. So this particular painting was done by a contemporary of Raphael. His name is Baldassar Paruzzi. And it's Apollo with the muses. You can tap the next one. I think it shows the... Um, so they're typically regarded as um, goddesses of song and dance. And they discover the letters and they combine them for poetry. So epic poetry, tragic poetry, sacred poetry, love poetry. And Urania, who is the goddess of astronomy. And it can seem quite confusing that you've got all this poetry and then astronomy. How is it that those things go together? So the Greeks at least in rendering their understanding of the muses and of the spiritual beings that gifted humanity this rhythm of speaking and understanding, they saw that poetry, they saw astronomy directly related to that. Urania is this being right here all the way to the right. I'm taking that from, it looks to me like that's her name written right under there. I don't read Greek, but it looks like that says Urania to me. All right, let's go to the next slide. And you can go ahead and tap it one more time. So in this, in this image, uh, Urania is this third one here. She's got that orb. Okay, so each one of them has a particular attribute and something that they carry with them to reveal 
uh, what, they, what they do. So Calliope is epic poetry, Clio is history, Melpomene is tragedy, Euterp, and I might be pronouncing, mispronouncing them, is lyric poetry, Erato is love poetry, Terpsichore is dance, Urania is astronomy, Thalia is comedy, and Polyhymnia is sacred poetry. And this is the order in which it is believed that they were born. So Urania, astronomy, is the seventh of the nine sisters. Now, they were the daughters of Zeus and memory. So what it was believed is that the muses, by combine, gathering the letters and combining them into poetry and giving them to the poets, the poets could tell these epic tales through memory. It was an oral tradition. It wasn't written down. And so memory served to grant fame or to bring love or to bring celebration or to depict tragedy. But also, memory worked with Urania, not toward the past, but toward the future. Of all of the sisters, she's the only one that has assigned to her a specific science, and her gift is an ability to read the future. She's also a daughter of memory, so somehow she's using memory to access something that's future. So this is beyond time and space. She's remembering the future. So she stands in line with the muses as one who has the companionship of poets and artists and this rhythmic celebration until we get to the time of Nicholas Copernicus. And then you could say that Urania now has the companion of weight and measure and number and this capacity to tell the future goes away. The muses kind of disappear. So this is what John Donne was pointing at. This is very, very sad that now this epic poetry, this song, this saga, the sacred poetry, the dance, this delight is disappearing. The muses had as one of their closest friends peace. And the place where they danced was at the top of Mount Olympus. Sad thing, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, let's go to the next. I mean, it's fascinating to consider that Urania, as goddess of, po of astronomy, stands side by side with her sisters, who are all goddesses of poetry. Astronomy was regarded as poetry. That's beautiful. And when you look at the night sky, when you look at what's happening in the morning sky, it's really easy to understand how that was believed. And if you say, okay, not only that, if the fixed stars are the consonants, and the moving stars are the vowels. And these muses brought about poetry. They needed Urania to access for that for them because she could understand the positions of the stars. So she kind of stands between her sisters and the, the actual celestial world. She's picking out where they are, and then her sisters are rendering it in poetry. Really beautiful relationship. Then we get to the Parthenon. Now, this is not going to be a real history tour, but remember, I'm coming at this from the humanities. <laughs> okay, so the Parthenon is built uh, as the temple of Athena, who's the patroness of Athens. And the Parthenon has a really interesting history in the world of the humanities. Go ahead and tap the next. When we get to the 1700s and Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin. Tap again. And you can tap it again. Sorry that you're going to sit here and read all this stuff. I'm going to tell you the same thing. So at the time that Thomas Bruce was traveling to Athens, it was understood that the highest examples of classical architecture were not in Rome. They were actually in Greece. So he goes to Athens, and he gets permission to go up to the Parthenon and take, um, oh, what do you call that? Rubbings. Rubbings of all of the magnificent art that's carved into this structure. But not only does he take rubbings, he actually takes the art. He refuses, he removes the friezes and some of the pediments and remarkable pieces of this structure and ships it to England. Now, it was believed, I love this part right here, it was believed at this time that by gazing upon works of art, a person could become somewhat enlightened by being infected by the spirit of the piece and of the artist. This is like accessing the muse that inspired the poetry of these kinds of creations and the stories that were being told. If you could look on that, then you also might find inspiration. But what happens is to Lord Elgin, so he lost all his money, he married well, but then his relationship went bad. 
he got syphilis, his nose fell off. He got to Athens, he took, and this might not be exactly in that order, but these are all the things that happened to him. He took beautiful pieces from this structure, put them on boats, shipped them to France, excuse me, up to England. The boats sank. He had to get, salvage all of this magnificent ancient artwork, got it to England. The English weren't interested in it. It sat in a shed, and then finally it was sold to the British Museum, and it hasn't stopped causing contention since that time. The Greeks want it back, and they want it back now. And as a poet, I have to say that, you know, all true poets really want these marbles to be restored to their place. Um, so I don't mean to offend anybody who might be Greek or British, but uh, it rightfully belongs to the Greeks. And even though he claimed that he was given permission to be on the grounds and to do what he did, and that he did a great um, service to the Greeks by protecting the marbles. It's, it's a touchy thing. If you Google it, you'll see there's just these rampant things. I mean, just as recently as this year, a minister of culture from Greece has been to Britain to say, we need them back. At least let the, us display them, but the, the British are not willing to let them have them. So it's a big controversy. Um, but when it first, when these marbles were first put on display, one of the most prolific, well, I, prolific is maybe not the word, one of my favorite poets of that era, uh, John Keats, wrote a magnificent poem about it. So this is a picture of one of the pediments that Lord Elgin took from the Parthenon that's now on display in the British Museum. Has anybody ever seen that? Yes. Yes? Yeah. yes? So, the Parthenon marbles, not the Elgin marble, the Parthenon marbles in Britain. Hello, sorry, there's not a lot of room in here. Okay. All right, so, next. So, John Keats, when he saw these marbles as a poet, so sensitive to the majesty of what he was looking at, it just completely undid him. My spirit is too weak. Mortality weighs heavily on me like unwilling sleep. And each imagined pinnacle and steep of godlike hardship tells me I must die, like a sick eagle looking at the sky. Yet tis a gentle luxury to weep that I have not the cloudy winds to keep fresh for the opening of the morning's eye. Such dim conceived glories of the brain bring round the heart an undescribable feud. So do these wonders a most dizzy pain that mingles Grecian grandeur with the rude wasting of old time with a billowy mane, a sun, a shadow of a magnitude. Now, oftentimes, this poem is regarded as just Keats talking about how undone he is by seeing the grandeur and the beauty of this art. But you could infer, if you're me, you would infer, that maybe he's talking about how devastating it is that this is created, we are created, and then it's torn apart. He would have been very, very sensitive to that. So again, um, I mean, these, these things that were created in classical Greek times, inspired by an understanding of divinity that was inhabiting the celestial world and creating these temples on the earth, was a way to create an abode for the gods on the earth. The Greeks actually believed that through their temples, that Athena, particularly at the Parthenon, that she could come and reside there. So they had to be magnificent structures built out of symmetry that had this marvelous artwork so that it was a celebration, a place where the muses could dance and sing and recite their poetry. Let's go to the next slide. So again, John Keats, he wrote his Ode on a Grecian Urn. Go ahead and, go ahead and tap till we get, okay. So this is the Portland vase, which is what inspired that poem in John Keats. And I ha this is not the whole poem, but I only excerpted part of it because I really think that he's tucking the stars in there in this place where he says, um, fair youth beneath the trees. Can you, is it, is it uh, focused? Sorry, I'm going to stand here next to you. Oh, fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not ha leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss Though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou, thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. So he's 
lamenting with the lover that he's never going to actually get to her, he's never going to actually get to kiss her, but she's never going to fade. Her loveliness will endure. And so that thrill of the chase also is never going to completely go away. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodi melodist, unwearied, un sorry, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new, more happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young. Um, I don't have the priest. Okay, I'm going to skip down to this verse. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadest thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? Okay, so he's saying, who is it that's bringing all these people here to this celebration? And where is the town that's not depicted on this vase that's empty of all these celebrants who have come to this wedding celebration? and the priest leading a cow that's lowing at the skies. So that's where I launch off and say, okay, he's talking about something that he can also see in the sky. We see in the region where we have the constellation Taurus the bull. Just below Taurus is the constellation Orion. And just above Taurus, actually connected to Taurus in the constellation, is the star cluster of the Pleiades, known as the Seven Sisters. Now for the Greeks, Orion was a hunter. But he was also a womanizer. He was always chasing the Pleiades. But the bull, or Taurus, stood between to defend them. So it seems like Keats is just ever so lightly touching that. That this heifer lowing at the sky, and that these lovers who can never quite come together, they're fixed, just like the fixed stars of Orion and Pleiades with the cow Taurus between them. Let's go to the next. So I just want to point out, and I'm sorry that I don't have a pointer. Here's Orion right here. Just above it is Taurus, and you see where the Pleiades are? So Orion would have been running toward the Pleiades to try to capture them. So just like the Grecian urn that Keats was memorializing in his poem, we have this fixed nature of the stars in the night sky. So Orion, he's, he's not moving but he was believed to be chasing the Pleiades. So that's always going to be happening. It's not going to change. And I want to point out that here we have Orion with Taurus above it, and over here we have the lion. You see Leo on the left-hand side? We're going to come back to that, but so just, just so that you can see. This is only half of the sky. The straight line that's going across the middle is what's called the celestial equator. That's just an imaginary line that we project from the Earth's equator. So we know what's above the celestial equator and what's below. And then this dotted line that goes on that circle, that's if you, you're not looking at a sphere, you open it out, it looks like the planets are doing that. So that's the, that's the route that the planets take. So notice they only go through Leo, Cancer, Gemini, Taurus, Pisces, and all the going backward. But only through the stars and zodiac. So I showed you that picture in the beginning. The planets are only ever seen moving along that dotted line. Orion is just below it, Taurus is right on it, Pleiades is just above it, and then over there to the east we have Leo. Let's go to the next slide. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. no. Okay. So here we have Raphael's painting of the Transfiguration. So Raphael has painted the being of the Christ. He's fully transformed. There's a prayer that I know that says, uh, from my head to my feet I am the image of God. I remember when I talked about earlier how it was believed that every human being comes from a star. And that from Aries to Libra, it was understood that these were already ascending forces. And we have this freedom toward uh, upward mobility from the head and the <laughs> voice box and the limbs and the rib cage. So this is all ascending up. But then from the Scorpion, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, going down to the feet, we're still oriented toward the earth. But when we look at this image of the Transfiguration, the celestial mystery behind it is that this being of the Christ, at least as it was regarded by the master paintings of the Renaissance, had ascended all of those celestial forces. Even the position of the feet was significant. And behind that was the mystery of Pisces. One foot in the physical world, one foot in the spiritual world. And these two great beings, I think they're Elijah and Moses? If we imagine the being of the Christ as the constellation of Orion, then we have on the one side, we have the bull, and on the other side, the lion. 
which is an image that so shows up in esoteric art, rendering the apostles that, and the beings that are around the Christ. And I'm not going to talk about it too much, but just to point out that this lower half of the image, this being here is regarded as the divine feminine, who is not yet fully awakened. The realization of the incarnation of the Christ being and the resurrection is what awakens this consciousness of the divine feminine. If you look at the night sky during the time of the Christian festival of Easter, you see that the sun appears to be in front of the region of the stars of Pisces, so the earth in front of it, behind the earth you would see the region of the constellation Virgo, the maiden. So this divine feminine is related to Virgo, the maiden. Okay, let's go to the next, so the transfiguration. This is an image that comes from a, a building that was built in the 19 teens, so the beginning of the 20th century in Dornach, Switzerland, called the Gartiana, after Goethe, the great scientist in the German culture. It's called the Red Window, and it faced west. So we have this center, it's, it's very esoteric, but a lot of it also rooted in an understanding of the stars around the Earth. The face at the center, you can imagine, as this being of the Christ, or this, this representation of the full human being. And then you see on the, what's my, right hand side, the left hand side, you have the bull, and then, or excuse me, the lion, and then on the right hand side, the bull. These three beasts on the left hand panel are related to the constellation of the Hydra with Corvus and Crater on its back. And then it is depicting this human being that's coming through a particular spiritual realization and then rising up in consciousness. Let's switch to the next slide. This was the window. So that picture that I just showed you was actually in that window. Now this structure was built in, like I said, the 19-teens by a group of international builders um, during the time that World War I was raging all around Europe. And this is happening on a hill in Dornach, Switzerland. And it was, the intention of it was that it would be a home for the spiritual nature of the human being. You would enter into this building and be lifted up because what was inside was this wisdom about the human being coming from a star and everything from <coughs> the form of the columns and the architect, the architraves, the color, everything was designed to hold and support the uprightness and the striving of the human being. So this red window faced west and the foundation stone was laid for this building when the planet Mercury was setting as the evening star in the west. So it was built on this axis that lined it up with the cosmos. And then in 1922, uh, on New Year's Eve, there was a lecture that was being given. At the time, there was this movement for religious renewal. And um, there were people that lived in the surrounding community that thought that the folks involved in this project were starting a new religion. And that was really contentious. I remember World War I is going on. And so things are pretty sketchy. And on New Year's Eve, 1922 to 1923, this building was completely burned down by arsonists. Mm -hmm. So it was rebuilt. They didn't put it in the picture. But now this was all carved in wood. And it had a double intersecting cupola. Then it was recreated in concrete form. And it's still there to this day. The red window did remain intact. And so it's still facing west on that structure over the same place where the foundation was laid. So again, arts inspired by the cosmos. Architectural form that's pretty contemporaneous to us that is still happening in the world. OK, let's go to the next slide. So this comes from Rudolf Steiner, who was the lead in that particular um, structure designed that window, designed that structure, and was the leader of, well, not really the leader, but really lived behind the impulse of what was trying to emerge as conscious awareness of the human being at that time. And this was a poem that he wrote that depicts this idea that the stars spoke once to man. This is a reference to the ancients. Okay, so they believed the stars were speaking to them. They organized themselves out of that speaking of the stars. It is world destiny that they are silent now. This is when Copernicus comes along. Now we start to move the earth around the sun, and this understanding of how we come from a star that goes to sleep and it goes away. And so what Rudolf Steiner was trying to express is that this can be a painful experience. Once we realize that there used to be this living, lively, wakeful encounter and relationship with the starry world, once we realize that that's gone, it's very painful. 
But what human beings have to do is awaken to an understanding that it's up to us now to speak back to the stars. How do we do that? How do we speak to a star? It goes out and say, hey, I'm here and I see you. I mean, what does that look like? Is it relationship? Is it how we work with one another? Is it how we create our civic organization and the things that we do to one another? So just a question. So go ahead, I think there's three more. So the first part refers to the astrology, the astro logos, logos being the word, the star word. This is what was the knowledge, the leading knowledge of the ancients. Then we get to the astronomia, the body of knowledge about the stars. So how far away are they? What is the surface temperature? What is the chemical composition of the core? Then this human being speaking back to the stars refers to an astrosophia. So I showed you that picture of the transfiguration by Raphael and that being of the divine feminine. This is the Sophia, wanting to awaken and speak again to the stars. Next slide. Are you still with me? Mm-hmm. It's hot in here. Okay. <laughs> um, kind of contemporary with Rudolf Steiner, but not really working in the same sphere, we have Pablo Picasso. Next. Uh, lived from the 1880s until 1973, and Edwin Hubble, who is a contemporary of Picasso. Go ahead and tap it again. Uh, so 1889 to 1953. So these two on the earth at the same time, just like Copernicus and Michelangelo. So we have Edwin Hubble, who's an astronomer, and Pablo Picasso, who's an artist. And again, this is not to try to show a causal relationship. What one thing is thinking is causing uh, something in, a, in another. But that something is emerging in the consciousness. So with Picasso, tap the next, Capa, Capa, <laughs> Picasso introduces this form of art that starts to be called cubism. Very abstract. Something totally different than what preceded it. Edwin Hubble, we tap it again. Edwin Hubble was the first scientist to say, you know, the Milky Way is not the only galaxy in our universe. I've been watching this star in the region of the constellation of Andromeda, where we thought there was a nebula, and it just might be that that's another galaxy. This was only in the 1920s. Less than 100 years ago, we believed that the Milky Way was the only galaxy. I mean, is that wild? That's less than 100 years ago. Now we know that there are galaxies all over the place. There are lots and lots and lots of them, but we can only see them with our telescopes. We don't know them as human beings when we walk outside and look into the sky because we can't see them, although we can see the Andromeda galaxy, furthest thing away from us that we can see with the naked eye. So this totally changed our thinking about our place in space. At the time that this idea is taking hold, so is this idea taking hold in the world of art. And something I couldn't depict here, we have the introduction of something new in the realm of music, and that's jazz. So all of this emerging at the same time. And again, not in a causal way. This idea is not causing this art, which is not causing that music, but the artists and the creators and the thinkers are all responding to something new that's coming, something that's coming toward humanity, something new that is being expressed in an art form, in a music form, and in a scientific understanding. So for me, that's what's really exciting about thinking about <coughs> arts inspired by the cosmos. Something that's happening simultaneously in the world of humanity that's finding it, its expression in art can really show us a lot about what we believe. How does this idea that the Earth is in a galaxy that's not the only one, is it related to this? Is this an expression, an artistic expression of that understanding? Was Michelangelo's painting of the Sistine ceiling with God reaching toward Adam to instill life, is that the last representation of this belief that the earth is at the center? I mean, they're just questions to ask, but they stir the imagination, and I think that's why it's so essential to just step back from our technology and, and look more from the humanities at what's happening around this kind of discovery that we are making. So let's go to the next slide. We're getting to the end. Okay. Then we get to the 1980s. This is the first color photograph of the planet Venus. It was not the first image, but it's the first color image. If you can tap it a couple more times here. Okay, uh, just stop right there. So this is the first image, Venera 13 from the Soviet Union, and this image came on March 1st in 1982 at the same time that you're tapping one more time. 
Jay Giles band had a number one hit with My Angel is a Centerfold. My blood runs cold, my memory is just been sold, my angel is a centerfold. So let's imagine Botticelli's painting of the birth of Venus. In Venus, Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty. That is the seat for what lives as love in the human heart. This is coming out of an inspired imagination that still believes that the muses are gifting this kind of understanding to humanity. But as soon as we've created the kind of technology that allows us to actually get to the surface of Venus and we see this simultaneously, we have that. So I'm not saying that they cause one another, but when this is the image of love and beauty, what does it do to us? What consequence is there in us when we have tried to unmask this great mystery that has inspired so many centuries of human beings? No offense to Jay Giles, I danced to that song a lot in the 80s, but it's fascinating that these things are happening simultaneously. This angel, this goddess of love and beauty has all the way fallen down to become naked in a magazine. So, okay, next. This image I just got yesterday. This is the planet Pluto, press it one more time. But Pluto um, using something called the principal component analysis, which is something that scientists use in order to really show up the surface features so they can distinguish them from one another. Pluto is not that color. It's just projecting those colors so you can see where are the variations to try to understand what is the surface of Pluto like. Just like we were trying to look at what was the surface of Venus. I didn't find a song that's contemporary to this, but I think we could probably all find one. Of Uptown Funk. <laughs> 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 so this image was taken from about 22,000 miles away from the surface of Pluto. Now Pluto, god of the underworld, the ancients did not speak his name. They probably would not dare to try to take his picture. <laughs> Pluto was the um, only planet to be discovered by an American when it was still regarded as a planet by Tomba in 1930. It was named by an 11-year-old, Venetia Burney, who lived in England. Her grandfather had been a librarian at Oxford, and he was reading a newspaper to her over breakfast one day, and so there's this young man in the United States who discovered this new planet, Planet X, and there's a worldwide invitation for people to submit ideas for a name. Well, Venetia had been studying her classical mythologies, and when her grandfather described to her that this planet was so far away that the sunlight almost didn't get there, it was really cold and icy, she said, it sounds like the underworld. Why did they name it Pluto after the god of the underworld? So her grandfather telegraphed that information, that idea to Oxford, and they sent it over to the United States. And then in March of 1930, the announcement came that that was going to be the name for this planet. At the same time, again, arts inspired by the cosmos, there was a young man who had just <laughs> introduced a cartoon mouse to the world. <laughs> because this created such a craze, once it was named, he introduced a dog as the companion to that mouse and named it for this planet, Pluto. And that was Walt Disney. So, always finding these relationships between the, the stars and the planets and what's happening on Earth. Next slide. Da -da -da. I think we're coming to the end. Okay. Uh, this was last month in the New Yorker magazine. So there's this great battle that goes on between the humanities and religion and science. And there's a lot of ways to interpret this particular cartoon. You could say that belief in God blocks an ability to see, or that not believing in God blocks an ability to see. I mean, there's a lot. It's just kind of an interesting image. You know, that we have this idea that through our technology we can see more and more and more. But are we knowing more? And have we let go of a certain necessary, artistic, creative, harmonious expression of that understanding? So for me, that's what lives intimately behind an idea of protecting a night sky place. It's not just so that we can get out there and look at the stars, which is a beautiful, awe-inspiring thing. It's about protecting our imaginations, so that we can continue to dream and create. Albert Einstein, um, you know, he's pretty famous for saying things like, uh, you can't fix the problem with the same thinking that got you into the problem. He was all about developing healthy imagination. When he was asked how to raise intelligent children, he said, read them fairy tales. And everybody laughed, and they said, what else can we do? And he said, more fairy tales. <laughs> it wasn't for to teach them math in kindergarten. 
Mm -hmm. If he had been living in our time, it wasn't give everybody in the first grade a computer. Mm -hmm. It was develop their imaginations so that they can create new things. Because we've got the world the way it is out of what we've created. We need new impulses. Those impulses come from human beings that are awake and sensitive to their environment. We can see through history something always coming that is being rendered by the artists, by the poets, by the scientists, by the thinkers a certain way that moves humanity along, either to great <coughs> creation or toward a lot of destruction, as we just have recently seen. Next. I think I wanted to end with a beautiful poem by Lord Byron, and one more. This is artwork that's being done by a contemporary artist by the name of Wendy Arden, and she, this is all watercolor, so she uses the classical art and architecture as her inspiration, but she's not trying to imitate the classicists, she's just rendering it according to what she sees now. So, I love this poem by Byron, although Byron had a reputation for being a womanizer, and chances are he was talking about a woman in this poem, but it's a lovely poem when you think about the planet Venus in the sky. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meets in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace that waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. I might have a little bit off because I'm not <laughs> And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, the tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. Venus, as goddess of love and beauty, knows what lives deeply in the heart of the human being. A mind at peace with all below. You can imagine Venus as the goddess of beauty walking through the night. We see her at night. The gaudy day has nothing on this goddess of the night. We can look into the heart of the human being and be at peace with what lives as truth there. Okay, I think that's one more slide and then we're done. So this is a picture of the Milky Way over the heavens. And one last verse from Rudolf Steiner. The more abundantly the harmony of the cosmos fills the soul, the more peace and harmony there will be on the earth. We could have just talked about architecture. I really wanted to come at it, though, mainly through the muses and through the poetry, because, um, because it's something that really stirs me. Yeah, the lights about to go on. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> and while a lot of you that stood out there, sorry that you couldn't, I hope you could see this. Um, but there's going to be a quiz now, because I have some t-shirts to give away. <laughs> and uh, also, I don't have an idea what time it is. Because I was hoping that we could play a couple games. Just because uh, it's hard to sit here and get all this information coming at you. Does anybody have any questions about what I shared? What is the word Astrosophia? Astrosophia. So astrologos, so astro means star, and logos is the word, so astrology, astronomia is the body of knowledge. So Astrosophia is the divine wisdom the stars. But as it's related to the human being. So you have philosophia, right, the Greek sense. So, so they, they saw this being of Sophia as something that was streaming toward them from the celestial world, the spiritual world, that would have to be embodied by the human being, and then it would have to emerge again. And that's what the astro Sophia would be that time when the human being again recognizes this relationship with the stars. So not out of an astrology, which was a suitable way to understand it for the ancients. The astronomy, which you know, starts with the scientific revolution with Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and, and those folks. It's, it's Johannes Kepler, by the way, 
who is the one that says, oh, they're not circles, they're ellipses. I'm checking my head so I can see that. And then when we get to the beginning of the 20th century, and Rudolf Steiner is really one of the first people starting to talk about this, this relationship that the human being can have with starry worlds that isn't bound to just the, the weight and the measure and the number that comes through the science of astronomy. Because astronomy wasn't regarded just as a science, it was, it was poetry. It was a capacity to use the gift of memory to foretell the future. So it was a function, it was telling the future was a function of memory. So memory, we think of it as something that just takes us into the past. It's kind of a hard thing to conceive of because the sense of memory is that it takes us toward what's past. But what the Greeks saw is that it also allows us to access the future. But that was the highest capacity, and only the very rare initiate could attain that. So not like, oh, I'm going to use the stars to predict my future. But when I move <coughs> into the realm where I can have that relationship with the stars, then something is revealed to me. It's not that I'm seeing the light of the star that was emitted so long ago that by the time it gets to me, that star isn't even there anymore. It's that actually I'm seeing a divine script that's revealing the intention of the spiritual world, and when I can read that, I'm seeing the future. So it's the exact opposite, which is fascinating. And I think it's hard to get there through the laws that we have in the physical world that are described through astrophysics and mathematics. It's really easy to, much easier to get there through poetry, through stories, through songs, through dance. And we can see the inspiration of this kind of idea in some of the art forms. Okay, thanks everybody. I mean, that's a really exciting piece of work for me. So, <laughs> so I have two t-shirts to do, right? Um, let's see. I'll start with a hard question first. Who can name the muse of epic poetry? Wow, I was up there twice. Calliope? Calliope, I read you all, right? Oh, no, blue. Okay. Well, good. Except this, this one, well, if, it, if a guy gets it, then he's on the two sides. Oh. <laughs> all right, so we have a woman's one. This is a women's. They're oh. both the same size. I'll take they that. both give you the opportunity to shamelessly advertise her headlines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good job. I mean, that was good, right? Yeah. 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 That was the All right. Um, Let's see. Sexton. Sexton. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a chuckle. Don't call out the answer. Is that <laughs> I just want to. You want to teach her? Teach her. Okay. I, I do want to again talk about the one that you should all know because you're here. This is very self serving. When did the headlands become an internationally designated dark sky park? What year? 2012? Oh, yeah. What do you say? Oh, 2011! Alright! <laughs> 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 so, here's what I wanted to do. This is a game. We have to divide up into groups, but let me explain it first. <laughs> so, there's this book called The Edge of the Sky that I found out about in this catalog called Community, uh, no, Communicating Astronomy to the Public. So these are all these PhDs in astronomy trying to figure out how come we can't get people to listen to us when we talk about what we're so excited about. And of course, I think, well, because if you would recite a poem instead, so they might be <laughs> really, really biased toward my own approach. But there was this really interesting article by this man named Roberto, R Roberto, I mean, it's a woman, Trota, who studies black holes. And this individual came across this challenge of using only the most common words in our language to describe phenomena or just to describe your work. So she wrote this book using only those most common words. It's called the 1000 word challenge because thousand is not one of the most common words in the language. So what, uh, what was done, the people who put this challenge together, they took the most enduring literature and took out, you know, through, through several centuries, and they took out the most commonly used words and said, okay, here's the 1,000 most commonly used words. And now the challenge is to create a story, describe your job, a phenomena, only using those words. So the word moon isn't there, eclipse isn't there. How are you going to describe that if those words aren't available to you? So what I